Chapter Thirty of Historical Tales, Volume Two, American Two. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Historical Tales, Volume Two, American Two, by Charles Morris. Chapter Thirty: Fontaine, the Scout, and the Besiegers of Vicksburg. The Civil War was not lacking in its daring and interesting adventures of scouts, spies, dispatch-bearers, and others of that interesting tribe whose field of operations lies between the armies in the field, and whose game is played with life as the stake, this being fair prey for the bullet if pursued, and often for the rope if captured. We have the story of one of these heroes of hazard to tell, a story the more interesting from the fact that he was a cripple, who seemed fit only to hobble about his home. It is the remarkable feat of Lamar Fontaine, a Confederate dispatch-bearer, which the record of the war has nothing to surpass. Fontaine's disability came from a broken leg, which had left him so disabled that he could not take a step without a crutch, and in mounting a horse he was obliged to lift the useless leg over the saddle with his right hand. But once in the saddle he was as good a man as his fellow, and his dexterity with the pistol rendered him a dangerous fellow to face when it became a question of life or death. We must seek him at that period in 1863, when the stronghold of Vicksburg, on which depended the Confederacy's control of the Mississippi, was closely invested by the army of General Grant, the siege lines so continuous alike in the rear of the town and on the Mississippi and its opposite shore, that it seemed as if hardly a bird could enter or leave its streets. General Johnston kept the field in the rear, but Grant was much too strong for him, and he was obliged to trust the chapter of chances for the hope of setting Pemberton free from the net by which he was surrounded. Knowing the daring and usual success of Lamar Fontaine in very hazardous enterprises, Johnston engaged him to endeavor to carry a verbal message to General Pemberton, sending him out on the perilous and seemingly impossible venture of making his way into the closely beleaguered city. In addition to his message, he took with him a supply of some forty pounds of percussion caps for the use of the besieged garrison. On the 24th of May, 1863, Fontaine set out from his father's home at a considerable distance in the rear of the Federal lines. He was well mounted and armed with an excellent revolver and a good sabre, which he carried in a wooden scabbard to prevent its rattling. His other burdens were his packet of percussion caps, his blanket, and his crutches. That night he crossed Big Black River, and before dawn of the next day was well within the lines of the enemy. Travel by day was now out of the question, so he hid his horse in a ravine, and found a place of shelter for himself in a fallen tree that overlooked the road. From his hiding place he saw a confused and hasty movement of the enemy, seemingly in retreat from too hot a brush with the garrison. Waiting till their columns had passed and the nightfall made it safe for him to move, he mounted again and continued his journey in the direction of Snyder's Bluff on the Yazoo. Entering the telegraphic road from the Yazoo city to Vicksburg, he had not gone far before he was confronted and hailed by a picket of the enemy. Spurring his spirited steed, he dashed past at full speed. A volley followed him, one of the balls striking his horse, though none of them touched him. The good steed had received a mortal wound, but by a final and desperate effort it carried its rider to the banks of the Yazoo River. Here it fell dead, leaving its late rider afoot, and lacking one of his crutches, which had been caught and jerked away by the limb of a tree as he dashed headlong past. With the aid of his remaining crutch and carrying his baggage, Fontaine groped his way along the riverside, keenly looking for some means of conveyance on its waters. He soon found what he wanted in the shape of a small log canoe, tied to a tree on the river bank. Pressing this into his service and disposing himself and his burden safely within, he paddled down the stream, hoping to reach the Mississippi and drift down to the city front before break of day. Success was not to come so easily. A sound of puffing steam came from down the river, and soon a trio of gunboats loomed through the gloom, heading towards Yazoo City. These were avoided by taking shelter among a bunch of willows that overhung the bank and served to hide the boat from view. The gunboats well passed, Fontaine took to the current again, soon reaching Snyder's Bluff, which was lighted up and a scene of animation. Whites and blacks mingled on the bank, and it looked like a midnight ball between the Yankee soldiers and bells of sable hue. Gunboats and barges lined the shore, and the light was thrown far out over the stream. But those present were too hilarious to be watchful, and lying flat in his canoe the scout glided safely past, 
the dugout not distinguishable from a piece of driftwood. Before the new day dawned he reached the back water of the Mississippi, but in the darkness he missed the outlet of the Yazoo and paddled into what is called Old River. The new day reddened in the east while he was still vainly searching for an opening into the broad parent stream. Then his familiarity with the locality showed him his mistake, and he was forced to seek a hiding place for himself and his boat. He had now been out two days and nights. The little food he brought had long been devoured, and hunger was assailing him. Sleep had also scarcely visited his eyes, and the strain was growing severe. Getting some slumber that day in his covert, he set out again as soon as night fell, paddling back into the Yazoo, from which he soon reached the Mississippi. He was here on a well-peopled stream, boats and lights being abundant. As he glided on through the gloom he passed forty or fifty transports, but had the good fortune to be seen by only one man, who hailed him from the stern of a steamer and asked him where he was going. "'To look after my fishing lines,' he replied. "'All right. Hope you'll have a good catch.' And he floated on. Farther down in the bend of the stream above Vicksburg, he came upon a more animated scene. Here were the mortar-boats in full blast, bombarding the city, every shot lighting up the stream for a wide space around. But the gun-crews were too busy to pay any attention to the seeming drift-log that glided silently by the fleet, or to notice the man that lay at full length within it. On he went, trusting to the current and keeping his recumbent position. The next day's dawn found him in the midst of the Confederate picket-boats in front of the city. Here, tying a white handkerchief to his paddle, he lifted it as a flag of truce, and sat up with a loud hurrah for Jeff Davis and the Confederacy. As may well be imagined, his cheers were echoed by the boatmen when they learned his mission, and he was borne in triumph ashore and taken to General Pemberton's headquarters. He received a warm welcome from the general, alike for the message he brought and the very desirable supply of percussion caps. It was with no little admiration that Pemberton heard the story of a daring feat that seemed utterly impossible for a cripple on crutches. During the next day the scout wandered about the beleaguered city, viewing the animated and in many respects terrible scene of warfare which it presented, the fierce bombardment from the Federal works extending in a long curve from the river above to the river below the city, the hot return fire of the defendants, the equally fierce exchange of fire between the gunboats and mortars and the entrenchments on the bluffs, the bursting of shells in the city streets, the ruined habitations, and the cave-like refuges in which the citizens sought safety from the death-dealing missiles. It was a scene never to be forgotten, a spectacle of ruin, suffering, and death. And the suffering was not alone from the terrible enginery of war, but from lack of food as well, for that dread spectre of famine, that in a few weeks more was to force the surrender of the valiantly defended city, was already showing its gaunt form in the desolated streets and the foodless homes. Fontaine was glad enough after his day and night among the besieged to seek again the more open field of operations outside. Receiving a dispatch from General Pemberton to his colleague in the field, and a suitable reward for his service, he betook himself again to the canoe which had stood him in such good stead, and resumed his task of danger. He was on a well-guarded river and had to pass through a country full of foes, and the peril of his enterprise was by no means at an end. The gloom of evening lay on the stream when he once more trusted himself to the swift current, which quickly brought him among the craft of the enemy below the city. Avoiding their picket-boats on both sides of the river, he floated near the gunboats as safer, passing so near one of them that through an open porthole he could see a group of men playing cards and hear their conversation. He made a landing at length at Diamond Place, bidding adieu to his faithful dugout and gladly setting foot on land again. Hobbling with the aid of his crutch through the bottom lands, the scout soon reached higher ground, and here made his way to the house of an acquaintance, hoping to find a mount. But all the useful horses and mules on the place had been confiscated by the foe. There remained only a worthless old gelding and a half-broken colt, of which he was offered the choice. He took the colt, but found it to travel so badly that he wished he had chosen the gelding. In this dilemma fortune favored him, for in the bottom he came upon a fine horse, tied by a blind bridle and without a saddle. A basket and an old bag were lying close by, and he inferred from this that a negro had left the horse, and that a camp of the enemy was near at hand. Here was an opportunity for confiscation of which he did not hesitate to avail himself, and in all haste he exchanged bridles, saddled the horse, turned loose the colt, mounted, and was off.' 
He took a course so as to avoid the supposed camp, but had not gone far before he came face to face with a Federal soldier, who was evidently returning from a successful foray for plunder, for he was well laden with chickens and carrying a bucket of honey. He began questioning Fontaine with a curiosity that threatened unpleasant consequences, and the alert scout ended the colloquy with a pistol belt which struck the plunderer squarely in the forehead. Leaving him stretched on the path with his poultry and honey beside him, Fontaine made all haste from that dangerous locality. Reaching a settlement at a distance from the stream, he hired a guide to lead him to Hankerson's Ferry on the Big Black River, promising him fifty dollars if he would take him there without following any road. They proceeded till near the ferry, when Fontaine sent his guide ahead to learn if any of the enemy were in that vicinity. But there was something about the manner and talk of the man that excited his suspicion, and as soon as the fellow was gone, he sought a hiding place from which he could watch his return. The man was gone much longer than appeared necessary. At length he came back alone and reported that the track was clear, there being no Yankees near the ferry. Paying and dismissing the guide without showing his suspicions, Fontaine took good care not to obey his directions, but selected his course so as to approach the river at a point above the ferry. By doing so he escaped a squad of soldiers that seemed posted to intercept him, for as he entered the road near the river bank a sentinel rose not more than ten feet away and bade him to halt. He seemed to form the right flank of a line of sentinels posted to command the ferry. It was a time for quick and decisive action. Fontaine had approached, pistol in hand, and as the man hailed he felled him with a bullet, then wheeled his horse and set out at full gallop up the stream. A shower of balls followed him, one of them striking his right hand and wounding all four of its fingers. Another grazed his right leg, and a third cut a hole through his sword scabbard. The horse fared worse, for no fewer than seven bullets struck it. Reeling from its wounds, it still had strength to bear up for a mile when it fell and died. He had outridden his foes, who were all on foot, and dividing his arms and clothes into two packages, he trusted himself to the waters of the Big Black, which he swam in safety. On the other side he was in friendly territory, and did not walk far before he came to the house of a patriotic southern woman, who loaned him the only horse she had. It was a stray one, which had come to her place after the Yankee foragers had carried off all the horses she owned. Fontaine was now in a safe region. His borrowed horse carried him to Raymond by two o'clock the next morning, and was here changed for a fresh one, which enabled him to reach Jackson during the forenoon. Here he delivered his dispatch to General Johnston, having successfully performed a feat which, in view of its difficulties and his physical disability, may well be classed as phenomenal. End of chapter 30《Chapter Thirty One of Historical Tales, Volume Two, American Two. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Historical Tales, Volume Two, American Two, by Charles Morris. Chapter Thirty One Gordon and the Bayonet Charge at Antietam. In the opening chapter of General John B. Gordon's interesting reminiscences of the Civil War, he tells us that the bayonet, so far as he knew, was very rarely used in that war, and never effectively. The bayonet, the lineal descendant of the lance and spear of far past warfare, had done remarkable service in its day, but with the advent of the modern rifle its day ended, except as a weapon useful in repelling cavalry charges or defending hollow squares. Fearful as their glittering and bristling points appeared when leveled in front of a charging line, bayonets were rarely reddened with the blood of an enemy in the Civil War, and the soldiers of that desperate conflict found them more useful as tools in the rapid throwing up of light earthworks than as weapons for use against their foes. Later in his work, Gordon gives a case in point in his vivid description of a bayonet charge upon the line under his command on the bloody field of Antietam. This is well worth repeating as an illustration of the modern ineffectiveness of the bayonet, and also as a story of thrilling interest in itself. As related by Gordon, there are few incidents in the war which surpass it in picturesqueness and vitality. The Battle of Antietam was a struggle unsurpassed for its desperate and deadly fierceness in the whole war, the losses in comparison with the numbers engaged being the greatest of any battlefield of the conflict. The plain in which it was fought was literally bathed in blood. 
It is not our purpose to describe this battle, but simply that portion of it in which General Gordon's troops were engaged. For hour after hour a desperate struggle continued on the left of Lee's lines, in which charge and countercharge succeeded each other, until the green corn which had waved there looked as if it had been showered upon by a rain of blood. But during those hours of death not a shot had been fired upon the centre. Here General Gordon's men held the most advanced position, and were without a supporting line, their post being one of imminent danger in case of an assault in force. As the day passed onward, the battle on the left at length lulled, both sides glad of an interval of rest. That McClellan's next attempt would be made upon the center, General Lee felt confident, and he rode thither to caution the leaders and bid them to hold their ground at any sacrifice. A break at that point, he told them, might prove ruinous to the army. He especially charged Gordon to stand stiffly with his men, as his small force would feel the first brunt of the expected assault. Gordon, alike to give hope to Lee and to inspire his own men, said in reply, These men are going to stay here, General, till the sun goes down or victory is won. Lee's military judgment, as usual, was correct. He had hardly got back to the left of his line when the assault predicted by him came. It was a beautiful and brilliant day, scarcely a cloud mantling the sky. Down the slope opposite marched through the clear sunlight a powerful column of Federal troops. Crossing the little Antietam Creek, they formed in column of assault, four lines deep. Their commander, nobly mounted, placed himself at their right, while the front line came to a charge bayonets, and the other lines to a right shoulder shift. In the rear front, the band blared out martial music to give inspiration to the men. To the Confederates, looking silently and expectantly on the coming corps, the scene was one of thrilling interest. It might have been one of terror, but for their long training in such sights. Who were these men so spick and span in their fresh blue uniforms, in strange contrast to the ragged and soiled Confederate gray? Every man of them wore white gaiters and neat attire, while the dust and smoke of battle had surely never touched the banners that floated above their heads. Were they new recruits from some military camp, now first to test their training in actual war? In the sunlight the long line of bayonets gleamed like burnished silver. As if fresh from the parade ground they advanced with perfect alignment, their steps keeping martial time to the steady beat of the drum. It was a magnificent spectacle as the line advanced a show of martial beauty which it seemed a shame to destroy by the rude hand of war. One thing was evident to General Gordon. His opponent proposed to trust to the bayonet, and attempt to break through Lee's center by the sheer weight of his deep-charging column. It might be done. Here were four lines of blue marching on the one in gray. How should the charge be met? By immediate and steady fire, or by withholding his fire till the lines were face to face, and then pouring upon the Federals a blighting storm of lead, Gordon decided on the latter, believing that a sudden and withering burst of deadly hail in the faces of men with empty guns would be more than any troops could stand. All the horses were sent to the rear, and the men were ordered to lie down, in the grass, they being told by their officers that the Federals were coming with unloaded guns, trusting to the bayonet, and that not a shot must be heard until the word fire was given. This would not be until the Federals were close at hand. In the old revolutionary phrase, they must wait till they saw the whites of their eyes. On came the long lines, still as steady and precise in movement as if upon holiday drill. Not a rifle shot was heard. Neither side had artillery at this point, and no roar of cannon broke the strange silence. The awaiting boys in gray grew eager and impatient, and had to be kept in restraint by their officers. Wait, wait for the word, was the admonition. Yet it was hard to lie there while that line of bayonets came closer and closer, until the eagles on the buttons of the blue coats could be seen, and at length the front rank was not twenty yards away. The time had come. With all the power of his lungs, Gordon shouted out the word, FIRE! In an instant there burst from the prostrate line a blinding blaze of light, and a frightful hail of bullets rent through the Federal ranks. Terrible was the effect of that consuming volley. Almost the whole front rank of the foe seemed to go down in a mass. The brave commander and his horse fell in a heap together. In a moment he was on his feet. It was the horse, not the man, that the deadly bullet had found. In an instant more the recumbent Confederates were on their feet, an appalling yell bursting from their throats as they poured new volleys upon the Federal lines. No troops on earth could have faced that fire without a chance to reply. Their foes bore unloaded guns, 
not a bayonet had reached the breast for which it was aimed. The lines recoiled, though in good order, for men swept by such a blast of death. Large numbers of them had fallen, yet not a drop of blood had been lost by one of Gordon's men. The gallant man who led the Federals was not yet satisfied that the bayonet could not break the ranks of his foes. Reforming his men, now in three lines, he led them again with empty guns to the charge. Again they were driven back with heavy loss. With extraordinary persistence he clung to his plan of winning with the bayonet, coming on again and again until four fruitless charges had been made on Gordon's lines, not a man in which had fallen, while the Federal loss had been very heavy. Not until convinced by this sanguinary evidence that the day of the bayonet was past, did he order his men to load and open fire on the hostile lines. It was an experiment in an obsolete method of warfare which had proved disastrous to those engaged in it. In the remaining hours of that desperate conflict, Gordon and his men had another experience to face. The fire from both sides grew furious and deadly, and at nightfall, when the carnage ceased, so many of the soldiers in gray had fallen, that, as one of the officers afterwards said, he could have walked on the dead bodies of the men from end to end of the line. How true this was Gordon was unable to say, for by this time he was himself a wreck, fairly riddled with bullets. As he tells us, his previous record was remarkably reversed in this fight, and we cannot better close our story than with a description of his new experience. He had hitherto seemed almost to bear a charmed life. While numbers had fallen by his side in battle, and his own clothing had often been pierced and torn by balls and fragments of shells, he had not lost a drop of blood, and his men looked upon him as one destined by fate not to be killed in battle. They can't hit him. He's as safe in one place as another, form a type of the expressions used by them, and Gordon grew to have much the same faith in his destiny as he passed through battle after battle unharmed. At Antietam the record was decidedly broken. The first volley from the Federal troops sent a bullet whirling through the calf of his right leg. Soon after, another ball went through the same leg at a higher point. As no bone was broken, he was still able to walk along the line and encourage his men to bear the deadly fire which was sweeping their lines. Later in the day a third ball came, this passing through his arm, rending flesh and tendons, but still breaking no bone. Through his shoulder soon came a fourth ball, carrying a wad of clothing into the wound. The men begged their bleeding commander to leave the field, but he would not flinch, though fast growing faint from loss of blood. Finally came the fifth ball, this time striking him in the face and passing out, just missing the jugular vein. Falling, he lay unconscious with his face in his cap, into which poured the blood from his wound until it threatened to smother him. It might have done so, but for still another ball which pierced the cap and let out the blood. When Gordon was born to the rear he had been so seriously wounded and lost so much blood that his case seemed hopeless. Fortunately for him his faithful wife had followed him to the war and now became his nurse. As she entered the room with a look of dismay on seeing him, Gordon, who could scarcely speak from the condition of his face, sought to reassure her with the faintly articulated words, "'Here is your handsome husband, been to an Irish wedding.' It was providential for him that he had this faithful and devoted nurse by his side. Only her earnest and incessant care saved him to join the war again. Day and night she was beside him, and when Erysipelas attacked his wounded arm, and the doctors told her to paint the arm above the wound three or four times a day with iodine, she obeyed by painting it, as he thought, three or four hundred times a day. Under God's providence, he says, I owe my life to her incessant watchfulness night and day, and to her tender nursing through weary weeks and anxious months. End of chapter 31Chapter 32 of Historical Tales, Volume 2, American 2. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Historical Tales, Volume 2, American 2, by Charles Morris. Chapter 32 The Last Triumph of Stonewall Jackson. The story of the Battle of Chancellorsville and of Jackson's famous flank movement, with its disastrous result to Hooker's army, and to the Confederates in the loss of their beloved leader, has been often told. But these narratives are from the outside. We propose to give one here from the inside, in the graphic description of Heros von Borke, General J. E. B. Stewart's Chief of Staff, who took an active part in the stirring events of that critical 2nd of May, 1863. 
It is a matter of general history how General Hooker led his army across Rappahannock into that ugly region at Chancellorsville, with its morasses, hills, and ravines, its dense forest of scrub oaks and pines, and its square miles of tangled undergrowth, which was justly known as the wilderness, and how he strongly entrenched himself against an attack in front, with breastworks of logs and an abatis of felled trees. It is equally familiar how Lee, well aware of the peril of attacking those formidable works, accepted the bold plan of Stonewall Jackson, who proposed to make a secret flank movement and fall with his entire corps on Hooker's undefended rear. This was a division of Lee's army which might have led to disaster and destruction. But he had learned to trust in Jackson's star. He accordingly made vigorous demonstrations in Hooker's front in order to attract his attention and keep him employed, while Jackson was marching swiftly and stealthily through the thick woods, with Stuart's cavalry between him and the foe, to the Orange Plank Road four miles westward from Chancellorsville. With this introductory sketch of the situation we leave the details of the march to von Borke. All was bustle and confusion as I galloped along the lines on the morning of the second to obtain, according to Stuart's orders, the latest instructions for our cavalry from General Lee, who was located at a distance of some miles to our right. Anderson's and McClaw's sharpshooters were advancing, and already exchanging shots with the enemy's skirmishers, the line of battle of these two divisions having been partially extended over the space previously occupied by Jackson's corps, that they might cover its movements. This splendid corps, meanwhile, was marching in close columns in a direction which set us all wondering what could be the intentions of old Stonewall. But as we beheld him riding along, heading the troops himself, we should as soon have thought of questioning the sagacity of our admired chief as of hesitating to follow him blindly wherever he should lead. The orders of the cavalry were to report to Jackson and to form his advance guard, and in that capacity we marched silently along through the forest, taking a small by-road, which brought us several times so near the enemy's lines that the stroke of axes mingled with the hum of voices from their camp was distinctly audible. Thus commenced the famous flank march, which more than any operation of the war proved the brilliant strategical talents of General Lee and the consummate ability of his lieutenant. About two o'clock a body of Federal cavalry came in sight, making, however, but slight show of resistance and falling back slowly before us. By about four o'clock we had completed our movement without encountering any material obstacle, and reached a patch of woods in rear of the enemy's right wing, formed by the Eleventh Corps, Howard's which was encamped in a large open field not more than a half-mile distant. Halting here, the cavalry threw forward a body of skirmishers to occupy the enemy's attention, while the divisions of Jackson's Corps, A.P. Hills, Colston's, and Rhodes, numbering in all about twenty-eight thousand men, moved into line of battle as fast as they arrived. Ordered to reconnoitre the position of the Federals, I rode cautiously forward through the forest and reached a point whence I obtained a capital view of the greater part of the troops whose attitude betokened how totally remote was any suspicion that a numerous host was so near at hand. It was evident that the whole movement we had thus so successfully executed was regarded as merely an unimportant cavalry raid, for only a few squadrons were drawn up in line to oppose us, and a battery of four guns were placed in a position to command the plank road from Germana, over which we had been marching for the last two hours. The main body of the troops were listlessly reposing, while some regiments were looking on, drawn up in dress parade. Artillery horses were quietly grazing at some distance from their guns, and the whole scene presented a picture of the most perfect heedlessness and nonchalance, compatible only with utter unconsciousness of impending danger. While complacently gazing on this extraordinary spectacle, somewhat touched myself, apparently, with the spell of listless incaution in which our antagonists were locked, I was startled with the sound of closely approaching footsteps and turning in their direction beheld a patrol of six or eight of the enemy's infantry just breaking through the bushes and gazing at me with most unmistakable astonishment. I had no time to lose here, that was certain, so quickly tugging my horse's head round in the direction of my line of retreat and digging my spurs into his sides, I dashed off from before the bewildered Yankees and was out of sight ere they had time to take steady aim, the bullets that came whizzing after me flying far wide of the mark. On my return to the spot where I had left Stuart, I found him, with Jackson and the officers of their respective staffs, stretched out along the grass beneath a gigantic oak, and tranquilly discussing their plans for the impending battle which both seemed confidently to regard as likely to end in a great and important victory for our arms. 
Towards five o'clock, Jackson's adjutant, Major Pendleton, galloped up to us and reported that the line of battle was formed and all was in readiness for immediate attack. Accordingly, the order was at once given for the whole corps to advance. All hastened forthwith to their appointed posts, General Stuart and his staff joining the cavalry, which was to operate on the left of our infantry. Scarcely had we got up to our men when the Confederate yell, which always preceded a charge, burst forth along our lines, and Jackson's veterans, who had been with difficulty held back till that moment, bounded forward towards the astounded and perfectly paralyzed enemy, while the thunder of our horse artillery, on whom devolved the honor of opening the ball, reached us from the other extremity of the line. The more hotly we sought to hasten to the front, the more obstinately did we get untangled in the undergrowth, while our infantry moved on so rapidly that the Federals were already completely routed by the time we had got thoroughly quit of the forest. It was a strange spectacle that now greeted us. The whole of the Eleventh Corps had broken at the first shock of the attack. Entire regiments had thrown down their arms, which were lying in regular lines on the ground, as if for inspection. Suppers just prepared had been abandoned. Tents, baggage, wagons, cannons, half-slaughtered oxen covered the foreground in chaotic confusion, while in the background a host of many thousand Yankees were discerned scampering for their lives as fast as their limbs could carry them, closely followed by our men, who were taken prisoners by the hundreds and scarcely firing a shot. That the story of panic here told is not too much colored by the writer's sympathy for his cause may be seen by the following extract from Lossing's Civil War in America, a work whose sympathies are distinctly on the other side. After saying that Jackson's march had not passed unobserved by the Federals, who looked on it as a retreat towards Richmond, and were preparing for a vigorous pursuit of the supposed fugitives, Lossing thus describes the Confederate onset and the Federal rout. He, Jackson, had crossed the Orange Plank Road, and under cover of the dense jungle of the wilderness had pushed swiftly northward to the old turnpike and beyond, feeling his enemy at every step. Then he turned his face toward Chancellorsville, and just before six o'clock in the evening he burst from the thickets with twenty-five thousand men, and like a sudden, unexpected, and terrible tornado, swept on towards the flank and rear of Howard's corps, which occupied the national right. The game of the forest, deer, wild turkeys, and hares, flying wildly before him, and becoming to the startled Unionists the heralds of the approaching tempest of war. These mute messengers were followed by the sound of bugles, then by a few shots from approaching skirmishers, then by a tremendous yell from a thousand throats and a murderous fire from a strong battle line. Jackson, in heavy force, was upon the Eleventh Corps at the moment when the men were preparing for supper and repose, without a suspicion of danger near. Levin's division, on the extreme right, received the first blow, and almost instantly the surprised troops, panic-stricken, fled towards the rear along the line of the Corps, communicating their emotions of alarm to the other divisions. In the wildest confusion, the fugitives rushed along the road towards Chancellorsville, upon the position of General Carl Schurz whose division had already retreated, in anticipation of the onset, and the turbulent tide of frightened men rolled back upon General A. von Steinwehr, utterly regardless of the exertions of the commander of the corps and his subordinate officers to check their flight. Only a few regiments, less demoralized than the others, made resistance, and these were instantly scattered like chaff, leaving half their number dead or dying on the field. With this vivid picture of an army in a panic, we shall again take up von Borke's personal narrative at the point where we left it. The broken nature of the ground was against all cavalry operations, and though we pushed forward with all our will, it was with difficulty we could keep up with Jackson's foot cavalry, as this famous infantry was often called. Meanwhile, a large part of the Federal army, roused by the firing and the alarming reports from their rear, hastened to the field of action, and exerted themselves in vain to arrest the disgraceful rout of their comrades of the Eleventh Corps. Numerous batteries having now joined the conflict, a terrific cannonade roared along the lines, and the fury of the battle was soon at its full height. Towards dark, a sudden pause ensued in the conflict, occasioned by Jackson giving orders for his lines to reform for the continuation of the combat, the rapid and prolonged pursuit of the enemy having thrown them into considerable confusion. Old Stonewall, being thoroughly impressed with the conviction that in a few hours the enemy's whole forces would be defeated, and that their principal line of retreat would be in the direction of Eli's Ford, Stuart was ordered to proceed at once towards that point with a portion of his cavalry, in order to barricade the road and, as much as possible, impede the retrograde movement of the enemy. 
In this operation we were joined by a North Carolina infantry regiment, which was already on its way towards the river. Leaving the greater part of the brigade behind us under Fitz Lee's command, we took only the 1st Virginia Cavalry with us, and trotting rapidly along a small by-path overtook the infantry about two miles from the ford. Riding with Stuart a little ahead of our men, I suddenly discovered, on reaching the summit of a slight rise in the road, a large encampment in the valley to our right, not more than a quarter of a mile from where we stood and farther still on the opposite side of the river more campfires were visible, indicating the presence of a large body of troops. Calling a halt, the general and I rode cautiously forward to reconnoitre the enemy a little more closely, and we managed to approach near enough to hear distinctly the voices and distinguish the figures of the men sitting around their fires or strolling through the camp. The unexpected presence of so large a body of the enemy immediately in our path entirely disconcerted our previous arrangements. Nevertheless, Stuart determined on giving them a slight surprise, and disturbing their comfort by a few volleys from our infantry. Just as the regiment, mustering about a thousand, had formed into line according to orders, and was prepared to advance on the enemy, two officers of General A. P. Hill's staff rode up in a great haste and excitement, and communicated something in a low tone to General Stuart, by which he seemed greatly startled and affected. "'Take the command of that regiment and act on your own responsibility,' were his whispered injunctions to me, as he immediately rode off, followed by the other officers and the cavalry at their topmost speed. The thunder of the cannon, which for the last hour had increased in loudness, announced that Jackson had recommenced the battle, but as to the course or actual position of affairs I had not an iota of information, and my anxiety being moreover increased by the suddenness of Stuart's departure on some unknown emergency, I felt rather awkwardly situated. Here was I, in the darkness of the night, in an unknown and thickly wooded country some six miles from our main army, and opposite to a far superior force, whom I was expected to attack with troops whom I had never before commanded, and to whom I was scarcely known. I felt, however, that there was no alternative but blind obedience, so I advanced with the regiment to within about fifty yards of the enemy's encampment, and gave the command to fire. A hail of bullets rattled through the forest, and as volley after volley was fired, the confusion and dismay occasioned in the camp were indescribable. Soldiers and officers could be plainly seen by the light of the fires walking helplessly about, horses were galloping wildly in all directions, and the sound of bugles and drums mingled with the cries of the wounded and flying, who sought in the distant woods a shelter against the murderous fire of their unseen enemy. The troops whom we thus dispersed and put to flight consisted, as I was afterward informed, of the greater part of Averill's cavalry division, and a great number of the men of this command were so panic-stricken that they did not consider themselves safe till they had reached the opposite side of the Rapidan, when they straggled off for miles all through Culpeper County. Our firing had been kept up for about half an hour, and had by this time stirred up alarm in the camps on the other side of the river, the troops of which were marching on us from various directions. Accordingly, I gave orders to my North Carolinians to retire, leaving the task of bringing his command back to the colonel. While, anxious to rejoin Stuart as soon as I could, I galloped on ahead through the dark forest, whose solemn silence was only broken by the melancholy cry of hosts of whippoorwills. The firing had now ceased altogether, and all fighting seemed to have been entirely given up, which greatly increased my misgivings. After a tedious ride of nearly an hour over the field of battle, still covered with hundreds of wounded groaning in their agony, I at last discovered Stuart, seated under a solitary plum-tree, busily writing dispatches by the dim light of a lantern. From General Stuart I now received the first intimation of the heavy calamity which had befallen us by the wounding of Jackson. After having instructed his men to fire at everything approaching from the direction of the enemy, in his eagerness to reconnoitre the position of the Federals, and entirely forgetting his own orders, he had been riding with his staff officers outside our pickets, when on their return, being mistaken for the enemy, the little party were received by a South Carolina regiment with a volley that killed or wounded nearly every man of them, and laid low our beloved Stonewall himself. The Federals advancing at the same time, a severe skirmish ensued, in the course of which one of the bearers of the litter on which the general was being carried was killed and Jackson fell heavily to the ground, receiving soon afterward a second wound. For a few minutes, in fact, the general was in the hands of the enemy, but his men, becoming aware of his perilous position, rushed forward, and speedily driving back the advancing foe, carried their wounded commander to the rear. Jackson received three balls, one in the right hand and two in the left arm, 
one of these shattering the bone just below the shoulder and severing an artery. He was borne to the wilderness tavern, where a Confederate hospital had been established, and there his arm was amputated. Eight days after receiving his wounds, on the 10th of May, he died, an attack of pneumonia being the chief cause of his death. His last words were, as a smile of ineffable sweetness passed over his pale face, Let us cross over the river and rest under the shade of the trees. Thus died the man who was justly named the right hand of General Lee, and whose death converted his last great victory into a serious disaster for the Confederate cause, the loss of a leader like Stonewall Jackson being equivalent to the destruction of an army. End of chapter 32、Chapter、Morgan'sFamousRaid The romance of war dwells largely upon the exploits of partisan leaders, men with a roving commission to do business on their own account, and in whose ranks are likely to gather the daredevils of the army, those who love to come and go as they please and leave a track of adventure and dismay behind them. There were such leaders in both armies during the Civil War, and especially in that of the South, and among the most daring and successful of them was General John H. Morgan, whose famous raid through Indiana and Ohio it is our purpose here to describe. Morgan was a son of the people, not of the aristocratic cavalier class, but was just the man to make his mark in a conflict of this character, being richly supplied by nature with courage, daring, and self possession in times of peril. He became a cavalry leader in the regular service, but was given a free foot to control his own movements, and had gathered about him a body of men of his own type, with whom he roamed about with a daring and audacity that made him a terror to the enemy. Morgan's most famous early exploit was his invasion of Kentucky in 1862, in which he kept the state in a fever of apprehension during most of the summer, defeating all who faced him and venturing so near to Cincinnati that the people of that city grew wild with apprehension. Only the sharp pursuit of General G. C. Smith with a superior cavalry force saved that rich city from being made an easy prey to Morgan and his men. As preliminary to our main story, we may give in brief one of Morgan's characteristic exploits. The town of Gallatin, twenty miles north of Nashville, was occupied by a small federal force, and seemed to Morgan to offer a fair field for one of his characteristic raids. His men were ready, they always were, for an enterprise promising danger and loot, and they fell on the town with a swoop that quickly made them its masters and its garrison their captives. While the victors were paying themselves for the risk by spoiling the enemy, Morgan proceeded to the telegraph office with a hope that he might find important dispatches. So sudden had been the assault that the operator did not know that anything out of the usual had taken place, and took Morgan for a northern officer. When asked what was going on, he replied, Nothing particular, except that we hear a good deal about the doings of that rebel bandit Morgan. If he should happen to come across my path, I have pills enough here to satisfy him. He drew his revolver and flourished it bravely in the air. Morgan turned on the braggart with a look and tone that quite robbed him of his courage, saying, I am Morgan. You are speaking to Morgan, you miserable wretch. Do you think you have any pills to spare for me? The operator almost sank on his knees with terror while the weapon fell from his nerveless hand. Don't be scared, said the general. I will not hurt you, but I want you to send off this dispatch at once to Prentice. The much scared operator quickly ticked off the following message Mr. Prentice. As I learn at this telegraph office that you intend to proceed to Nashville, perhaps you will allow me to escort you there at the head of my troop. John Morgan. What effect this dispatch had on Prentice, history saith not. With this preliminary account of Morgan and the character of his exploits, we proceed to the most famous incident of his career, his daring invasion of the North, one of the most stirring and exciting incidents of the war. The main purpose of this invasion is said to have been to contrive a diversion in favor of General Buckner, who proposed to make a dash across Kentucky and seize Louisville, and afterward, with Morgan's aid, to capture Cincinnati. It was also intended to form a nucleus for an armed counter revolution in the Northwest, where the Knights of the Golden Circle and the Sons of Liberty, associations in sympathy with the South, were strong. But with these ulterior purposes, we have nothing here to do, 
our text being the incidents of the raid itself. General Morgan started on this bold adventure on June 27, 1863, with a force of several thousand mounted men, and with four pieces of artillery. The start was made from Sparta, Tennessee, where the swollen Cumberland was crossed in boats and canoes on the 1st and 2nd of July, the horses with some difficulty being made to swim. After successful encounters with Jacob's cavalry and a troop of Wolford's cavalry, the adventurers pushed on, reaching the stockade at Green River Bridge on July 4th. Here Colonel Moore was strongly entrenched with a small body of Michigan troops, and sent the following reply to Morgan's demand for a surrender. If it was any other day I might consider the demand, but the 4th of July is a bad day to talk about surrender, and I must therefore decline. Moore proved quite capable, with the aid of his entrenchments, of hailing good his refusal, Morgan being repulsed after a brisk engagement, with a loss of about sixty men, as estimated by Captain Cunningham, an officer of his staff. Lebanon was taken, after a severe engagement on the 5th, yielding the Confederates a good supply of guns and ammunition, and the Ohio was reached at Brandenburg in a drenching rain on the evening of the 7th. Here two steamers were seized and the whole force crossed on the next day to the Indiana shore. General Morgan's force had been swelled by recruits gained in Kentucky, until it now numbered 4,600 men, and its four guns had become ten. But he was being hotly pursued by General Hobson, who had hastily got on his track with a cavalry force stronger than his own. This reached the river to see the last of Morgan's men safe on the Indiana shore, and one of the steamers they had used floating a mass of flames down the stream. Hobson's loss of time in crossing the stream gave Morgan twenty-four hours' advance, which he diligently improved. The advance of Rosencrantz against Bragg had prevented the proposed movement of Buckner to the north, and there remained for Morgan only an indefinite movement through the northern states with the secondary hope of finding aid and sympathy there. It was likely to be an enterprise of the utmost peril, with Hobson hotly on his track and the home guards rising in his front, but the dauntless Morgan did not hesitate in his desperate adventure. The first check was at Corydon, where a force of militia had gathered, but these were quickly overpowered, the town was forced to yield its quota of spoil, three hundred fresh horses were seized, and Morgan adopted a shrewd system of collecting cash contributions from the well-to-do, demanding one thousand dollars from the owner of each mill and factory as a condition of saving their property from the flames. It may be said here that Corydon was the principal place in which any strong opposition was made by the people, the militia being concentrated at the large towns, which Morgan took care to avoid, pursuing his way through the panic-stricken villages and rural districts. There were other brushes with the home guards, but none of much importance. The failure of the original purpose of the movement, and the brisk pursuit of the Federal cavalry, left Morgan little to hope for but to get in safety across the Ohio again. In addition to Hobson's cavalry force, General Judah's division was in active motion to intercept him, and the whole line of the Ohio swarmed with foes. The position of the raiders grew daily more desperate, but they rode gallantly on, trusting the result to destiny and the edge of their good swords. On swept Morgan and his men, on rushed Hobson and his troopers, but the former rode on fresh horses, the latter followed on jaded steeds. For five miles on each side of his line of march Morgan swept the country clear of horses, leaving his own weary beasts in their stead, while Hobson's force, finding no remounts, grew steadily less in number from the exhaustion of his horses. The people, through fear, even fed and watered the horses of Morgan's men with the greatest promptness, thus adding to the celerity of his movements. Some anecdotes of the famous ride may here be fitly given. At one point on his ride through Indiana, Morgan left the line of march with three hundred and fifty of his men to visit a small town, the main body marching on. Dashing into the place, he found a body of some three hundred home guards, each with a good horse. They were dismounted and their horses tied to the fences. Their captain, a confiding individual on the wrong side of sixty, looked with surprise at this eruption and asked, "'Whose company is this?' Wolford's cavalry was the reply. What? Kentucky boys? Glad to see you. Where's Wolford? There he sits, answered the man, pointing to Morgan, who was carelessly seated sideways on his horse. Walking up to Wolford, as he thought him, the Indiana captain saluted him. Captain, how are you? Bully, how are you? What are you going to do with all these men and horses? Why, you see that horse-thieving John Morgan is in this part of the country, cutting up the deuce, 
Between you and me, Captain, if he comes this way, we'll try and give him the best we've got in the shop. You'll find him hard to catch. We've been after him for fourteen days and can't see him at all, said Morgan. If our hosses would only stand fire, we'd be all right. They won't stand, eh? Not for shucks. I say, Captain, I'd think it a favor if you and your men would put your saddles on our hosses and give our lads a little idea of a cavalry drill. They say you're prime at that. Why, certainly, anything to accommodate. I think we can show you some useful evolutions. Little time was lost in changing the saddles from the tired to the fresh horses, the Hoosier boys aiding in the work, and soon the Confederates, delighted with the exchange, were in their saddles and ready for the word. Morgan rode up and down the column, then moved to the front, took off his hat, and said, "'All right now, Captain, if you and your men will form a double line along the road and watch us, we will try to show you a movement you have never seen.' The captain gave the necessary order to his men, who drew up in line. "'Are you ready?' asked Morgan. "'All right, Wolford.' "'Forward!' shouted Morgan, and the column shot ahead at a rattling pace, soon leaving nothing in sight but a cloud of dust. When the news became whispered among the astonished Hoosiers that the polite visitor was Morgan instead of Wolford, there was gnashing of teeth in that town, despite the fact that each man had been left a horse in exchange for his own. As Morgan rode on, he continued his polite method of levying attacks from the mill-owners instead of burning their property. At Salem, the next place after leaving Corydon, he collected three thousand dollars from three mill-owners. Capturing at another time, Washington de Pau, a man of large wealth, he said to him, "'Sir, do you consider your flour-mill worth two thousand dollars?' De Pau thought it was worth that. "'Very well, you can save it for that much money.' De Pau promptly paid the cash. "'Now,' said Morgan, "'do you think your woolen mill worth three thousand dollars?' "'Yes,' said De Pau, with more hesitation. "'You can buy it from us for that sum.' The three thousand dollars was paid over less willingly, and the mill-owner was heartily glad that he had no other mills to redeem." Another threat to burn did not meet with as much success. Colonel Craven of Ripley, who was taken prisoner, talked in so caustic a tone that Morgan asked where the colonel lived. At Osgood was the answer. That little town on the railroad? Yes, said the colonel. All right, I shall send a detachment there to burn the town. Burn and be hanged, said the colonel. It isn't much of a town anyhow. Morgan laughed heartily at the answer. I like the way you talk, old fellow, he said, and I guess your town can stand. As the ride went on, Morgan had more and more cause for alarm. Hobson was hanging like a burr on his rear, rarely more than half a day's march behind. The lack of fresh horses kept him from getting nearer. Judah was on his flank, and had many of his men patrolling the Ohio. The governors had called for troops, and the country was rising on all sides. The Ohio was now the barrier between him and safety, and Morgan rode thither at top speed, striking the river on the 19th at Buffington Ford above Pomeroy in Ohio. For the past week, as Cunningham says, every hillside contained an enemy and every ravine a blockade, and we reached the river dispirited and worn down. At the river, instead of safety, imminent peril was found. Hundreds of Judah's men were on their stream in gunboats to head him off. Hobson, Wolford, and other cavalry leaders were closing in from behind. The raiders seemed environed by the enemies, and sharp encounters began. Judah struck them heavily in flank. Hobson assailed them in the rear and hemmed in on three sides, and unable to break through the environing lines, five hundred of the raiders, under Dick Morgan and Ward, were forced to surrender. Seeing that the enemy had every advantage of position, says Cunningham, an overwhelming force of infantry and cavalry, and that we were becoming completely environed in the meshes of the net set for us, the command was ordered to move up the river at double quick and we moved rapidly off the field, leaving three companies of dismounted men and perhaps two hundred sick and wounded in the enemy's possession. Our cannon were undoubtedly captured at the river. Morgan now followed the line of the stream, keeping behind the hills out of the reach of the gunboat fire, till Bealeville, fourteen miles above, was reached. Here he rode to the stream, having distanced the gunboats, and with threats demanded aid from the people in crossing. Flats and scows were furnished for only about three hundred of the men, who managed to cross before the gunboats appeared in sight. Others sought to cross by swimming. In this effort, Cunningham had the following experience. My poor mare, being too weak to carry me, turned over and commenced going down. Encumbered by clothes, sabre, and pistols, I made but poor progress in the turbid stream. But the recollections of home, of a bright-eyed maiden in the sunny south, 
and an inherent love of life actuated me to continue swimming. But I hear something behind me snorting. I feel it passing. Thank God I am saved. A riderless horse dashes by. I grasp his tail. Onward he bears me, and the shore is reached. And thus Cunningham passes out of the story. The remainder of the force fled inland, hotly pursued, fighting a little, burning bridges, and being at length brought to bay, surrounded by foes and forced to surrender, except a small party with Morgan still at their head. Escape for these seemed hopeless. For six days more they rode onward in a desperate effort to reach the Ohio at some unguarded point. They were sharply pursued, and at length, on Sunday, July 26th, found themselves very hotly pressed. Along one road dashed Morgan at the full speed of his mounts. Over a road at right angles rushed Major Rue, thundering along. It was a sharp burst for the intersection. Morgan reached it first, and Rue thought he had escaped, but the Major knew the country like a book. His horses were fresh, and Morgan's were jaded. Another tremendous dash was made for the Beaver Creek Road, and this the Major reached a little ahead. It was all up now with the famous raid. Morgan's men were too few to break through the intercepting force. He made the bluff of sending a flag with a demand to surrender, but Rue couldn't see it in that light, and a few minutes afterward Morgan rode up to him, saying, You have beat me this time, and expressing himself as gratified that a Kentuckian was his captor. A mere fragment of the command remained, the others having been scattered and picked up at various points. And thus ended the career, in capture or death, of nearly all the more than four thousand bold raiders who had crossed the Ohio three weeks before. They had gained frame but with captivity as its goal. Morgan and several of his officers were taken to Columbus, the capital of Ohio, and were there confined in felon cells in the penitentiary. Four months afterward the leader and six of his captains escaped and made their way in safety to the Confederate lines. Here is the story in outline of how they got free from Durrance Vile. Two small knives served them for tools, with which they dug through the floors of their cells, composed of cement and nine inches of brickwork, and in this way reached an air-chamber below. They had now only to dig through the soft earth under the foundation walls of the penitentiary and open a passage into the yard. They had furnished themselves with a strong rope made of their bedclothes, and with this they scaled the walls. In some way they had procured citizens' clothes, so that those who afterward saw them had no suspicion. In the cell Morgan left the following note. Cell number 20, November 20th, 1863. Commencement, November 4th, 1863. Conclusion, November 20th, 1863. Number of hours of labor per day, three. Tools, two small knives. La patience est amère, mais son fruit est doux. Patience is bitter, but its fruit is sweet. By order of my six honorable confederates. Morgan and Captain Hines went immediately to the railroad station at one o'clock in the morning and boarded a train going toward Cincinnati. When near this city they went to the rear car, slackened the speed by putting on the brake, and jumped off, making their way to the Ohio. Here they induced a boy to row them across and soon found shelter with friends in Kentucky. A reward of one thousand dollars was offered for Morgan, alive or dead, but the news of the ovation with which he was soon after received in Richmond proved to his careless jailers that he was safely beyond their reach. A few words will finish the story of Morgan's career. He was soon at the head of a troop again, annoying the enemy immensely in Kentucky. One of his raiding parties, three hundred strong, actually pushed General Hobson, his former pursuer, into a bend of the Licking River, and captured him with twelve hundred well-armed men. This was Morgan's last exploit. Soon afterward, he, with a portion of his staff, were surrounded when in a house at Greenville by Union troops, and the famous Confederate leader was shot dead while seeking to escape. End of chapter 33「Chapter 34 of Historical Tales, Volume 2, American 2 – This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Historical Tales, Volume 2, American 2, by Charles Morris. Chapter 34, Homecoming of General Lee and His Veterans. Sad is defeat, and more than sad, was the last march of General Lee's gallant army after its four years of heroic struggle 
as it despondently made its way along the Virginian roads westward from the capital city which it had defended so long and valiantly. It was the verdant spring tide, but the fresh green foliage had no charms for the heartbroken and starving men, whose food supplies had grown so low that they were forced to gnaw the young shoots of trees for sustenance. It is not our purpose here to tell what followed the surrounding of the fragment of an army by an overwhelming force of foes, the surrender and parole, and the dispersion of the veteran troops to the four winds, but to confine ourselves to the homeward journey of General Lee and a few of his veterans. Shortly after the surrender, General Lee returned to Richmond, riding slowly from the scene on his iron-gray war-horse Traveller, which had borne him so nobly through years of battle and siege. His parting with his soldiers was pathetic, and everywhere on his road to Richmond he received tokens of admiration and respect from friend and foe. Reaching Richmond, he and his companions passed sadly through a portion of the city which exhibited a distressing scene of blackened ruins from the recent conflagration. As he passed onward he was recognized, and the people flocked to meet him, cheering and waving hats and handkerchiefs. The general, to whom this ovation could not have been agreeable, simply raised his hat in response to the greetings of the citizens, and rode on to his residence in Franklin Street. The closing of its doors upon his retiring form was the final scene in that long drama of the war, of which for years he had been the central figure. He had returned to that private family life for which his soul had yearned even in the most active scenes of the war. It is our purpose here to reproduce a vivid personal account of the adventures of some of the retiring soldiers, especially as General Lee bore a part in their experiences. The narrative given is the final one of a series of incidents in the life of the private soldier related by Private Carlton McCarthy. These papers, in their day, were widely read and much admired, and an extract from them cannot fail still to be of interest. We take up the story of the brave survivors homeward bound. Early in the morning of Wednesday the 12th of April, without the stirring drum or the bugle call of old, the camp awoke to the new life. Whether or not they had a country, these soldiers did not know. Home to many when they reached it was graves and ashes. At any rate, there must be somewhere on earth a better place than a muddy, smoky camp in a piece of scrubby pines, better company than gloomy, hungry comrades and inquisitive enemies and something in the future more exciting, if not more hopeful, than nothing to eat, nowhere to sleep, nothing to do, and nowhere to go. The disposition to start was apparent, and the preparations were promptly begun. To roll up the old blanket and oilcloth, gather up the haversack, canteen, axe, perhaps, and a few trifles, in time of peace of no value. Eat the fragments that remained, and light a pipe was the work of a few moments. This slight employment, coupled with the pleasant anticipations of the unknown, and therefore possibly enjoyable future, served to restore somewhat the usual light-hearted manner of soldiers and relieve the final farewells of much of their sadness. There was even a smack of hope and cheerfulness as the little group sallied out into the world to combat they scarcely knew what. As we cannot follow all these groups, we will join ourselves to one and see them home. Two Brothers in Arms whose objective point is Richmond, take the road on foot. They have nothing to eat and no money. They are bound for their home in a city which, when they last heard from it, was in flames. What they will see when they arrive there they cannot imagine, but the instinctive love of home urges them. They walk on steadily and rapidly and are not diverted by surroundings. It does not even occur to them that their situation, surrounded on all sides by armed enemies and walking a road crowded by them, is at all novel. They are suddenly aroused to a sense of their situation by a sharp, Halt! Show your parole! They had struck the cordon of picket posts which surrounded the surrendered enemy. It was the first exercise of authority by the Federal Army. A sergeant, accompanied by a couple of muskets, stepped into the road, with a modest air examined the paroles, and said quietly, Pass on. This strictly military part of the operation being over, the social commenced. As the two survivors passed on, they were followed by numerous remarks, such as, "'Hello, Johnny, I say. Going home? Ain't you glad?' They made no reply, these wayfarers, but they thought some very emphatic remarks. From this point on to Richmond was the grand thought. Steady work it was, 
The road, strangely enough, considering the proximity of two armies, was quite lonesome, and not an incident of interest occurred during the day. Darkness found the two comrades still pushing on. Some time after dark a light was seen a short distance ahead, and there was a sound of revelry. On approaching, the light was seen to proceed from a large fire, built on the floor of an old and dilapidated outhouse, and surrounded by a ragged, hungry, singing, and jolly crowd of paroled prisoners of the Army of Northern Virginia, who had gotten possession of a quantity of cornmeal and were waiting for the ash-cakes then in the ashes. Being liberal, they offered the newcomers some of their bread. Being hungry, they accepted and ate their first meal that day. Finding the party noisy and riotous, the comrades pushed on in the darkness after a short rest, and spent the night on the road. Thursday morning they entered the village of Buckingham Courthouse, and traded a small pocket mirror for a substantial breakfast. There was quite a crowd of soldiers gathered around a cellar door, trying to persuade an ex-Confederate commissary of subsistence that he might as well, in view of the fact that the army had surrendered, let them have some of the stores and after considerable persuasion and some threats, he decided to forego the hope of keeping them for himself, and told the men to help themselves. They did so. As the two tramps were about to leave the village and were hurrying along the high road which led through it, they saw a solitary horseman approaching from the rear. It was easy to recognize at once General Lee. He rode slowly, calmly along. As he passed an old tavern on the roadside, some ladies and children waved their handkerchiefs, smiled and wept. The general raised his eyes to the porch on which they stood, and slowly raising his hand to his hat, lifted it slightly, and as slowly again dropped his hand to his side. The survivors did not weep, but they had strange sensations. They passed on, steering, so to speak, for Cartersville and the ferry. Before leaving the village it was the sad duty of the survivors to stop at the humble abode of Mrs. P. and tell her of the death of her husband, who fell mortally wounded pierced by a musket-ball near Sailor's Creek. She was also told that a companion who was by his side when he fell, but who was not able to stay with him, would come along soon and give her the particulars. That comrade came and repeated the story. In a few days the dead man reached home alive and scarcely hurt. He was originally an infantryman, recently transferred to artillery, and therefore wore a small knapsack as infantry did. The ball struck the knapsack with a whack and knocked the man down. That was all. The night was spent in an old building near the ferry, and in the morning the ferryman cheerfully put them across the river without charge. Soon after crossing, a good, silver-plated tablespoon, bearing the monogram of one of the travellers, purchased from an aged colored woman a large chunk of ash cake and about half a gallon of buttermilk. This old darky had lived in Richmond in her younger days. She spoke of grown men and women there as chillin' what I raised. Lord, boss, does you know Miss Sadie? Well, I nursed her, and I nursed all of her children. That I did, sir. You chillin' does look hungry, that you does. Well, you's welcome to these vittles, and I'm powerful glad to get this spoon. God bless you, honey. A big log on the roadside furnished a comfortable seat for the consumption of the before-mentioned ash cake and milk. The feast was hardly begun when the tramp of a horse's hoofs were heard. Looking up, the survivors saw with surprise General Lee approaching. He was entirely alone and rode slowly along. Unconscious that anyone saw him, he was yet erect, dignified, and apparently as calm and peaceful as the fields and woods around him. Having caught sight of the occupants of the log, he kept his eyes fixed on them, and as he passed, turned slightly, saluted, and said, in the most gentle manner, "'Good morning, gentlemen. Taking your breakfast?' The soldiers had only time to rise, salute, and say yes, sir, and he was gone. It seems that General Lee pursued the road which the survivors chose, and starting later than they overtook them, he being mounted and they on foot. At any rate, it was their good fortune to see him three times on the road from Appomattox to Richmond. The incidents introducing General Lee are peculiarly interesting and the reader may rest assured of the truthfulness of the narration as to what occurred and what was said and done. After the feast of bread and milk, the no longer hungry men passed on. About the time when men who have eaten a hearty breakfast become again hungry, as good fortune would have it happen, they reached a house pleasantly situated and a comfortable place withal. Approaching the house, they were met by an exceedingly kind, energetic, and hospitable woman, 
She promptly asked, You're not deserters? No, said the soldiers, we have our paroles. We are from Richmond, we are homeward bound, and called to ask if you could spare us a dinner. Spare you a dinner? Certainly I can. My husband is a miller. His mill is right across the road there, down the hill, and I have been cooking all day for the poor starving men. Take a seat on the porch there, and I will get you something to eat. By the time the travelers were seated, this admirable woman was in the kitchen at work. The pat-a-pat-pat-pat-pat-pat-pat of the sifter, and the cracking and fizzing of the fat bacon as it fried saluted their hungry ears, and the delicious smell tickled their olfactory nerves most delightfully. Sitting thus, entertained by delightful sounds, breathing the air, and wrapped in meditation, or anticipation, rather, the soldier saw the dust rise in the air and heard the sound of an approaching party. Several horsemen rode up to the road-gate, threw their bridles over the posts or tied them to the overhanging boughs, and dismounted. They were evidently officers, well-dressed, fine-looking men, and about to enter the gate. Almost at once the man on the porch recognized General Lee and his son. They were accompanied by other officers. An ambulance had arrived at the gate also. Without delay they entered and approached the house, General Lee preceding the others. Satisfied that it was the general's intention to enter the house, the two brave survivors, instinctively and respectively venerating the approaching man, determined to give him and his companions the porch. As they were executing a rather rapid and undignified flank movement to gain the right and rear of the house, the voice of General Lee overhauled them thus. "'Where are you men going?' "'This lady has offered to give us a dinner, and we are waiting for it,' replied the soldiers. "'Well, you had better move on now. This gentleman will have quite a large party on him to-day,' said the general. The soldiers touched their caps, said, "'Yes, sir,' and retired, somewhat hurt, to a strong position on a hen-coop in the rear of the house. The party then settled on the porch. The general had, of course, no authority, and the surrender of the porch was purely respectful. Knowing this, the soldiers were at first hurt, but a moment's reflection satisfied them that the general was right. He, no doubt, had suspicions of plunder, and these were increased by the movement of the men to the rear as he approached. He misinterpreted their conduct. The lady of the house, a reward for her name, hearing the dialogue in the yard, pushed her head through the crack of the kitchen door, and as she tossed a lump of dough from hand to hand and gazed eagerly out, addressed the soldiers. "'Ain't that old General Lee?' "'Yes. General Lee and his son and other officers come to dine with you,' they replied. "'Well,' she said, "'he ain't no better than the men that fought for him, and I don't reckon he's as hungry, so you just come in here. I'm going to give you yours first, then I'll get something for him.' What a meal it was! Seated at the kitchen table, the large-hearted woman bustling about and talking away, the ravenous tramps attacked a pile of old Virginia hoe-cake and corn-dodger, a frying-pan with an inch of gravy and slices of bacon, streak of lean and streak of fat, very numerous. To finish, as much rich buttermilk as the drinkers could contain. With many heartfelt thanks, the survivors bade farewell to this immortal woman, and leaving the general and his party in the quiet possession of the front porch, pursued their way. Night found the survivors at the gate of a quiet, handsome, framed country residence. The weather was threatening, and it was desirable to have shelter as well as rest. Entering and knocking at the door, they were met by a servant girl. She was sent to her mistress with a request for permission to sleep on her premises. The servant returned, saying, "'Missus says she is a widder, and there ain't no gentleman in the house, and she can't let you come in.' She was sent with a second message, which informed the lady that the visitors were from Richmond, members of a certain company from there, and would be content with permission to sleep on the porch, in the stable, or in the barn. They would protect her property, etc., etc., etc. This message brought the lady of the house to the door. She said, If you are members of the... You must know my nephew. He was in that company. Of course they knew him. Old chum, comrade, particular friend, splendid fellow. Hope he was well when you heard from him. Glad to meet you, madam. These and similar hearty expressions brought the longed-for, Come in, gentlemen, you are welcome. I will see that supper is prepared for you at once. Invitation accepted. The old haversacks were deposited in a corner under the steps, and their owners conducted downstairs to a spacious dining-room, quite prettily furnished. A large table occupied the centre of the room, and at one side there was a handsome display of silver in a glass front case. A good big fire lighted the room. The lady sat quietly working at some woman's work, and from time to time questioning in a rather suspicious manner her guests. 
Their direct answers satisfied her, and their respectful manner reassured her, so that by the time supper was brought in she was chatting and laughing with her defenders. The supper came in steaming hot. It was abundant, well-prepared, and served elegantly. Splendid coffee, hot biscuit, luscious butter, fried ham, eggs, fresh milk. The writer could not expect to be believed if he should tell the quantity eaten at that meal. The good lady of the house enjoyed the sight. She relished every mouthful, and no doubt realized then and there the blessing which is conferred on hospitality, and the truth of that saying of old, It is more blessed to give than to receive. The wayfarers were finally shown to a neat little chamber. The bed was soft and glistening white, too white and clean to be soiled by the occupancy of two Confederate soldiers who had not had a change of underclothing for many weeks. They looked at it, felt of it, and then spread their old blankets on the neat carpet and slept there till near the break of day. While it was yet dark, the travellers, unwilling to lose time waiting for breakfast, crept out of the house, leaving their thanks for their kind hostess, and passed rapidly on to Manikin Town, on the James River and Kanawha Canal, half a day's march from Richmond, where they arrived while it was yet early morning. The greensward between the canal and river was inviting, and the survivors laid there a while to rest and determine whether or not they would push on to the city. They desired to do so as soon as they could find a breakfast to fit them for the day's march. In this venture they met with a new experience. The party applied to, a well-fed hardy man, gruffly repulsing them, and complaining that some scoundrels had stolen his best horse the night before. He finally invited them in and set before them the bony remnants of some fish he had had for breakfast. Rising indignantly from the table, the veterans told their inhospitable host that they were not dogs, and would consider it an insult to the canine race to call him one. Apparently fearing that the story of his behavior to old soldiers would be spread to his discredit, he now apologized for the mistake, and offered to have a breakfast cooked for them, but they were past being mollified, and left him with the most uncomplimentary epithets at the command of two old soldiers of four years' service. At eleven a.m. of the same day, Two footsore, despondent, and penniless men stood facing the ruins of the home of a comrade who had sent a message to his mother, Tell mother I am coming. The ruins yet smoked. A relative of the lady whose home was in ashes, and whose son said, I am coming, stood by the survivors. Well, then, he said, it must be true that General Lee has surrendered. The solemnity of the remark, coupled with the certainty in the minds of the survivors, was almost amusing. The relative pointed out the temporary residence of the mother, and thither the survivors wended their way. A knock at the door startled the mother, and with agony in her eyes she appeared at the open door, exclaiming, "'My poor boys!' "'Are safe in coming home,' said the survivors. "'Thank God!' said the mother, and the tears flowed down her cheeks. A rapid walk through ruined and smoking streets, some narrow escapes of negro soldiers on police duty, the satisfaction of seeing two of the boys in blue hung up by their thumbs for pillaging, a few handshakings, and the survivors found their way to the house of a relative, where they did eat bread with thanks. A friend informed the survivors that day that farm hands were needed all around the city. They made a note of that and the name of one farmer. Saturday night the old blankets were spread on the parlor floor. Sunday morning, the 16th of April, they bade farewell to the household and started for the farmer's house. As they were about to start away, the head of the family took from his pocket a handful of odd silver pieces, and extending them to his guests, told them it was all he had, but they were welcome to half of it. Remembering that he had a wife and three or four children to feed, the soldiers smiled through their tears at his, bade him keep it all, and weep for himself rather than for them. So saying, they departed, and at sundown were at the farmer's house fourteen miles away. Monday morning, the 17th, they beat their swords, muskets in this case, into plowshares, and did the first day's work of the sixty which the simple farmer secured at a cost to himself of about half rations for two men. Behold the gratitude of a people! Where grow now the shrubs which of old bore leaves and twigs for garlands? The brave live, are the fair dead? Shall time or calamity, downfall or ruin, annihilate sacrifice or hatch an ingrate brood? End of chapter 34 End of Historical Tales, Volume 2, American 2, by Charles Morris